Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. Did you know you can get Democracy Now!'s headlines and stories delivered directly to your inbox every day? Just text Democracy Now!, one word, no space, text Democracy Now! to 66866 to subscribe to our Daily Digest, and you'll never miss a story. Once again, Democracy Now!, one word, to 66866. Thanks so much, and stay safe. From New York, this is Democracy Now! This is a systemic problem. This is a structural problem that can be handled by better policy decisions. So that's why we're out here. That's why all of these people showed up. There was more people out here last night. Eviction emergency. Democratic Congress member Cory Bush has been sleeping on the steps of the U.S. Capitol since Friday night to protest her House colleagues adjourning without passing another extension of the eviction moratorium for renters, as nearly 12 million people are behind on rent. The congresswoman was once unhoused herself. Last week, she introduced the Unhoused Bill of Rights. We'll go to the Capitol to speak with Congressmember Bush, then inflamed deep medicine and the anatomy of injustice. The inflammation sends you to hospital, and when you're in the ICU, you look around and notice a disproportionate number of people of color. In the United States, hospitalization and death rates for people of color are far higher than for white people. You make another kind of diagnosis yourself. This, you observe, is the outcome of structural racism. But how did those structures come to be? To understand that, we must go back 600 years to a time when a different pestilence spread across the globe, one that continues today and which still makes us sick. We'll speak with Dr. Rupa Maria, physician, activist, and co-founder of the Do No Harm Coalition, and best-selling author Raj Patel. We'll also talk to Patel about his new film, The Ants and the Grasshopper, which follows the journey of a farmer and activist from Malawi to Wisconsin. It rains for us maybe three times a year. All the crops dry out. Soil, food, and healthy communities taught us that it was climate change because of what they're doing in places like America. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A nationwide moratorium on evictions expired Saturday night after Democratic lawmakers failed to pass a bill to protect millions of people who could be forced from their homes during the pandemic. Some progressive Democrats slammed Democratic leaders for beginning their summer recess before extending the moratorium. Democratic Congress member Cory Bush began camping out on the steps of the Capitol with others on Friday in protest. The night was, um, it was necessary to continue this awareness because we need, we need our, uh, the powers that be to understand that we're not just going to let this go quietly when the lives of actual people that we are supposed to represent, like, like actual whole people, like human beings, actually are at risk yeah. by this policy decision, so or the lack of one. So, we're out here. After Congress failed to extend the moratorium, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other Democratic lawmakers urged President Biden to take executive action. But the White House claims its power is limited due to a recent Supreme Court ruling in which Justice Kavanaugh said it was his view that congressional authorization would be necessary to extend the moratorium. We'll have more on the story later in the program with Congressmember Bush. The number of coronavirus hospitalizations in Florida has topped 10,000, and the number of daily new infections has exceeded 21,000 for the first time since the pandemic began, as the highly contagious Delta variant continues to spread. 
Florida accounts for about one in five COVID-19 cases nationwide. On Friday, Florida's Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, signed an executive order making masks optional in public schools. The United States is now averaging about 80,000 new cases a day, about six times as many as a month ago. On Sunday, top White House coronavirus adviser Anthony Fauci spoke to ABC and warned the country is heading in the wrong direction. Things are going to get worse. If you look at the acceleration of the number of cases, the seven-day average has gone up substantially. You know, what we really need to do, John, we say it over and over again, and it's the truth. We have 100 million people in this country who are eligible to be vaccinated, who are not getting vaccinated. China is battling its largest COVID outbreak in over a year. More than 300 cases have been confirmed across 15 provinces. China suspended all flights, trains and buses between Beijing and areas with confirmed cases. This comes as COVID cases continue to surge across Asia, with Thailand and Malaysia reporting record infections. In Japan, authorities reported over 4,000 new COVID cases in Tokyo Saturday, a new single-day high in the Olympic host city. In Turkey, at least eight people have died as over 100 wildfires continue to burn. President Erdogan has declared parts of southwestern Turkey to be disaster areas. Thousands have been evacuated. Greece, Italy and Spain are also battling fires fueled by intense heat in the latest sign of the climate emergency facing the world. Meanwhile, in Bangladesh, thousands of Rohingya refugees have been displaced after mass flooding in Cox's Bazaar, the world's largest refugee camp. At least six refugees have died. Many others lost all their belongings. The landslide fully damaged my house. Somehow my family members could evacuate. The mud that came down from the hill entered my home, and it was totally covered with mud. All of our belongings inside are covered in mud. There were very few things I could retrieve. In Afghanistan, dozens of people have died after flash floods in the Taliban-controlled Kamdesh district. The Taliban put the death toll as high as 150. Meanwhile, here in the United States, there are now 91 large wildfires burning in the West. The New York Times reports the bootleg fire in Oregon has now burned an area the size of Portland, Seattle, Sacramento and New York City combined. Authorities warn the fire may not be fully contained until October. Newly released Justice Department documents show Donald Trump directly asked the acting attorney general for help to overturn the November election. According to notes taken during a conversation on December 27th, Trump told Jeffrey Rosen, quote, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. Rosen refused. Ten days later, Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol in a bid to stop the counting of electoral votes. Meanwhile, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is facing widespread criticism for remarks he made about House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. During an event on Saturday, the top Republican in the House talked about what would happen if the Republicans gained control of the House. McCarthy said, quote, I want you to watch Nancy Pelosi hand me that gavel. It will be hard not to hit her with it. In response, Pelosi's spokesperson said, quote, a threat of violence to someone who is a target of a January 6th assassination attempt from your fellow Trump supporters is irresponsible and disgusting. McCarthy was speaking at a fundraiser of over a thousand people. In news from Afghanistan, the Taliban has stepped up attacks on three provincial capitals, Kandahar, Herat and Lashkar Gah. In response, the U.S. military launched airstrikes against Taliban fighters. On Sunday, at least three Taliban rockets hit Kandahar airport. And on Friday, at least one person died after rocket-propelled grenades and gunfire hit the main U.N. compound in Herat. Earlier today, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani presented a new security plan to a special session of parliament, but details were not made public. Israel's blamed Iran after a deadly attack on an oil tanker with links to an Israeli billionaire. Two crew members died in the attack, which took place off the coast of Oman. Iran has denied responsibility. 
Mexico, Russia and Bolivia have sent shipments of food and medical supplies to Cuba over the past week. Cuba is in the midst of a public health and economic crisis. On Sunday, Cuba reported nearly 10,000 new COVID-19 cases, the highest since the start of the pandemic. Miguel Diaz Reynoso is Mexico's ambassador to Cuba. Esta llegada tan esperada. This awaited arrival, together with other vessels, other forms of assistance, of cooperation, represent one simple and great thing. They are proof of friendship, of gratitude, of solidarity. That's what President Obrador asked for, for Cuba to have what it needs now, and that is what is being shipped. This comes as the Biden administration continues to reject calls to lift the U.S. embargo on Cuba. On Friday, the U.S. announced new sanctions on Cuba, and President Biden warned more sanctions might be coming. Over 700 refugees, including a three-month-old baby, were rescued off the coast of Libya and Malta over the weekend as they attempted to reach Europe. The humanitarian group SOS Mediterranean has carried out at least six separate rescue operations since Saturday. The group is searching for a safe location to disembark the asylum seekers. This comes as the number of refugees trying to reach European soil continues to grow due to worsening poverty, violence and the climate crisis. Over 1,100 refugees have perished crossing through dangerous sea routes so far this year. Meanwhile, Greek authorities on the island of Lesbos have drafted criminal charges against at least 10 humanitarian aid workers accusing migrant rescue groups of human trafficking. New Zealand has apologized to Pacific Islanders for the country's past racist anti-migrant policies. In the 1970s, New Zealand police routinely raided the homes of Pacific Islanders in the middle of the night looking for residents who had overstayed their visas. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern spoke Sunday. Today, I stand on behalf of the New Zealand government to offer a formal and unreserved apology to Pacific communities for the discriminatory implementation of the immigration laws of the 1970s that led to the events of the Dawn Raids. In Burma, the head of the military junta has named himself prime minister six months after the military seized power in a coup. Army chief Min Ong Hang has announced the state of emergency imposed after the military coup will extend for two more years. He also vowed to hold elections in 2023. Since the coup, more than 900 people have been killed and thousands arrested. The Washington Post reports police in the United States shot dead more than 1,000 people in 2020, the highest number since the Post began an effort to track police shootings in 2015. About one in five fatal shootings occurred after police were called to investigate reports of domestic violence or another type of domestic disturbance. Over the past six years, The Washington Post has documented more than 6,400 fatal police shootings, an average of almost three per day. In Connecticut, an Ecuadorian father of three who lived in a basement of a New Haven church for two years to avoid deportation has been granted a one-year stay of removal. Nelson Pinos has been living in the U.S. for nearly three decades. The 47-year-old was given a deportation order in 2017, prompting him to seek sanctuary at the church. In Tokyo, the International Olympic Committee says it's investigating whether an ex-gesture made by U.S. shot-put silver medalist Raven Saunders violated its ban on political statements. Saunders, who is African-American and identifies as queer, told reporters her gesture from the medal podium represented the, quote, intersection of where all people who are oppressed meet, unquote. In other Olympic news, U.S. gymnastics superstar Simone Biles says she will compete in the balance beam competition on Tuesday, about a week after she withdrew from her team finals for mental health reasons. Meanwhile, the Belarusian athlete Kristina Simonuskaya has entered Poland's embassy in Tokyo requesting political asylum. The 24-year-old athlete says she refused her coach's demand that she board a flight Sunday to return to Belarus out of fears for her safety after she criticized Belarusian Olympic officials. Anelka Schumann, the co-founder of Bread and Puppet Theatre Company, has died. 
who was born in the Soviet Union in 1935 and brought to the United States in 1941. She and her husband, Peter Schumann, began the Bread and Puppet Theater Company in 1963. Their first productions range from puppet shows for children to pieces protesting poor housing conditions. The group later moved to Vermont. Its processions involving monstrous puppets, some about 20 feet high, became a fixture of protests against the Vietnam War. The Bread and Puppet Theater also milled its own flour and baked its own bread, sharing it with audience members. This is Elke Schumann appearing in the 2001 film Ah, the Hopeful Pageantry of Bread and Puppet, produced by her daughter Tamar and Dee Dee Halleck. We have a grinder there, and we grind the grain ourselves, and the bread is not at all like your supermarket bread. You really have to chew it. You really have to put some work into it, but then you get something very good for that. And when our theater is successful, we feel it's the same way. You've got to think about it. It doesn't, like, tell you everything. It's not like Wonder Bread. It just, like, there it is. Here's the story. This is what it means. You've got to do some figuring yourself in the theater, in our theater, and if this play is successful, then at the end you probably feel it was worth the work. Elka Schumann died at the age of 85 on Sunday, surrounded by her five children and her partner, Peter Schumann. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The highly infectious coronavirus Delta variant is causing huge spikes in cases across the United States and around the world, with China struggling to control surging infections and the Philippines preparing for a new, stricter lockdown. The United States is now averaging some 80,000 new COVID cases a day, about six times as many daily cases than a month ago. As much of the world struggles to cope with the pandemic and its impacts, we begin today's show with the authors of a new book that examines the social and environmental roots of poor health. Your body is part of a society inflamed, write the authors. In a minute, we'll speak with the co-authors of Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice, best-selling author Raj Patel and physician and activist Rupa Maria. But first, this is an animated introduction to their book by Aaron Kerbel. You wake up one morning with a dry, hacking cough, and you've lost your sense of smell. You visit your doctor for a diagnosis. With an x-ray and nasal swab, she diagnoses COVID. The coronavirus infected your body, and your lungs and nerves are now inflamed. The inflammation sends you to hospital, and when you're in the ICU, you look around and notice a disproportionate number of people of color. In the United States, hospitalization and death rates for people of color are far higher than for white people. You make another kind of diagnosis yourself. This, you observe, is the outcome of structural racism. But how did those structures come to be? To understand that, we must go back 600 years to a time when a different pestilence spread across the globe, one that continues today and which still makes us sick. And it makes us sick in a patterned way, through inflammatory disease, which underlies all the leading causes of death in industrialized places. European colonization transformed the planet. Through slavery, genocide, and disease, colonists brought with them a cosmology that changed how people relate to each other and to the living world around them. Those who resisted were set to the flame. This history lives inside you, whether you know it or not. Since you were conceived, your body has been exposed to the consequences of a world on fire. The COVID hospital ward and the specific Specific patients who are in its beds look that way because of centuries of attempts to extinguish other kinds of knowledge and civilizations. If we understand disease with this new kind of diagnosis, the treatment options become radically different. The deep medicine we prescribe to address the inflammation of people and planet has been prescribed by others before us. Rudolf von Virchow and Sitting Bull and Franz Fanon. Huda Sha'arwi and B.R. Ambedkar and Harriet Tubman. They understood that our modern ills can't simply be vaccinated away. We need a world rebuilt with care at its heart. But what does that look like? Many indigenous communities have resisted colonialism by continuing to care for the living world around them. Their care for life protects them inside and out. Indigenous communities defend the greatest range of biodiversity on the planet.
the planet and, as a result, host the most diverse microbiota inside their bodies. These microbes confer protection against inflammatory disease. When culture isn't capitalist and isn't colonized, it can soothe the inflammatory diseases that afflict us and fuel the burning of our planet. Deep Medicine offers new and old stories that connect humans to the teeming microbes in our guts and to the teeming stars in the skies. We offer a glimpse into cosmologies that bring a cooling balm to a world, to societies, and to bodies that are inflamed. inflamed. That's the animated introduction by Aaron Kerbel to the book Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. For more, we're joined by the book's authors. In Austin, Texas, Raj Patel is with us, research professor at the University of Texas's Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, a professor in the university's Department of Nutritional Sciences, and a research associate at Rhodes University, South Africa. He's also the author of Stuffed and Starved, The Hidden Battle for the World's Food System, and the best-selling book, The Value of Nothing, How to Reshape Market Society and Redefine Democracy. And in Berkeley, California, we're joined by Dr. Rupa Maria, Associate Professor of Medicine at University of California, San Francisco, where she practices and teaches internal medicine. She's co-founder of the Do No Harm Coalition, a collective of health workers committed to addressing disease through structural change. And well, we welcome you both to Democracy Now! This is an epic work. Raj, let's begin with you in Texas. If you can talk about this connection between capitalism and the COVID pandemic— so, uh, th th thank you, Amy, for having us. And for uh, uh, you know, for, for listeners and viewers who are unaware. Um one of the ways that the, the modern food system operates uh, is through a sort of legacy of, uh, uh, of separating humans from the rest of the web of life. Now, uh, what that means is that uh, humans feel, uh, under capitalism, and particularly under capitalist colonialism, uh, to be able to be free to uh, exploit the world around us. And uh, we feel free to be able to do that because uh, the rest of the web of life is just worth less than uh, our profit motive. And that's why, for example, 60 percent of, of current human infectious diseases come from pathogens that jump from one species to another, uh, and the industrial food system incubates those kinds of diseases. Now, while the jury's out around COVID, uh, it's certainly the case that we've seen uh, a, a vast array of diseases coming from uh, the industrial food system. And so H1N1, for example, in uh, 2019 uh, was, I'm sorry, in, in 2009, uh, was one example of a disease uh, that emerged from a food system uh, which is quite happy with treating the rest of the web of life as a disposable resource, uh, and also quite happy in treating the working class uh, as uh, a, an experience expendable kind of uh, insulation between uh, the burn of disease and the needs of the, uh, the rich in the global north. Now, when you have a, a kind of setup that's based on this 600-year process of exploitation uh, and colonial domination, uh, then you're, you're preparing the world for uh, pandemics not just of uh, a virus, but also for the, the consequences of a virus reverberating through societies that are deeply unequal. And so what, you know, we opened t today's show talking about uh, the, the climate disasters that are happening around the world. Guess who it is that's on the front lines of, of the climate crisis, it's the same communities that are at the, the forefront who have been predominantly exposed to uh, the, the kinds of uh, d uh, narratives, the, the kinds of exposures that render their body more ready to become uh, uh, susceptible to, to COVID. Which brings us to the title, Dr. Rupa Maria, the title of your book, Inflamed Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. Talk about why you called it inflamed and the kind of work you've been doing that shows the disparities um, it, that result from the system that we have. Yes, thank you for having us, Amy, and I'm happy to be speaking to you today from the occupied territory of Huchin. You can see the West Berkeley Shell Mound, which our friends are trying to save, the oldest inhabited site here in um, the Bay Area. Um, so, Inflammation is the body's appropriate response to damage or the threat of damage. 
And um, the leading cause of death and illness in industrialized places are all inflammatory disease, whether we're talking about cardiovascular disease or cancer, Alzheimer's disease, depression, even suicide. All of these diseases have inflammation as a part of their um, as a part of their process. And um, we're learning now that the immune system is being um, primed for inflammatory disease through um, not just genetics, which is what we've been thinking about for many years. You know, why do some people get autoimmune disease? Why do some people get inflammatory bowel disease? Why do some people get cancer? Um, But now we're learning that the social structures around us, um, the environmental political structures around us are... um, are tuning the immune system to sound out the full range of inflammation. Um, And unfortunately, medical education is steeped in the same enlightenment um, errors that Raj was just speaking of, separating humans from the web of life, separating um, civilization from nature. Um, These kinds of dichotomies, these false dichotomies and errors are a part of medical education today. Um, So while it's helpful that we're talking about structural determinants of health as we're looking at the glaring um, disparities with the COVID crisis, um, we don't learn in medicine where these structures came from or how to dismantle them. And that is really what deep medicine is. If we want to be making an impact on these structures, if we want to be making an impact on the health outcomes, we have to start working with communities who are already identifying the problems and leading the change. Um, and so that is you know, a, a brief summary of what we're doing in this book. And if you can talk about the pandemic, Raj Patel, providing this kind of autopsy uh, of racial disparities in the country, the profound injustices in the system, um, in just a few moments, we'll be linking up with um, Congressmember Cory Bush, who has been sleeping on the steps of the Capitol with a number of other people protesting the fact that a eviction moratorium was allowed to expire, um, threatening millions of people in this country. This in the midst of a pandemic that is surging in this country. Well, as, as we uh, approach this, uh, you know, this expiration, uh, one of the, the big ideas that we have in the book is uh, particularly the, the, the way that uh, capitalism primes bodies, uh, as Rupert was saying, for, uh, for, for, for sickness. Uh, and, you know, this, this expiration is going to drive more people into despair. But we already have the technologies of uh, oppression that are geared towards sending the working class to despair. Things like payday loans, for example. You know, if, if you take out a payday loan for uh, $300, you might end up paying uh, you know, uh, upwards of eight hundred dollars, an APR of four hundred percent, and we we know that the the stress of needing to repay these loans uh, is uh, causing ill health. I mean, to the extent that if we were to ban things like payday loans, uh, then uh, in the United States, the suicide rate would fall by 2.1 percent and the fatal drug poisoning rate would drop by 8.9 percent. Now, that kind of ongoing stress uh, is uh, just a a normal feature of the way that capitalism operates in the United States. Uh, And this, you know, the, the, uh, the, this, this, moment of uh, triggering the, 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 the lapse of the, uh, you know, the, the eviction moratorium is going to drive yet more people to the abyss. But Rupert has been working, for example, in uh, San Francisco, uh, help, you know, working with physicians and protesting uh, with them around some, some of the eviction-related uh, issues and the issues around the unhoused there. Dr. Rupa Maria, if you can talk about that work for just about 30 seconds, then we're going to go to break. We're going to go to Congressmember Cory Bush, who's been sleeping out on the Capitol steps for the last few days to protest this eviction moratorium expiring. And then we're going to come back to the two of you. Yes, we um, have been, the Do No Harm Coalition has been working very closely with the Coalition on Homelessness, with Poor Magazine, formerly unhoused folks, uh, poor people who have solutions to the um, homeless, the manufactured crisis of homelessness here. Um, while you know we, London Breed has been celebrated for her response to COVID, eight, over 8,000 people were left on the streets of San Francisco in the midst of wildfire and, um, and the pandemic. Um, and so this is really a health crisis and um, it's an unnecessary health crisis. It's gonna jeopardize, it already is jeopardizing the health of so many people. So I applaud Cori Bush and her bill of rights for unhoused people. We need to um, look to formerly unhoused and unhoused people for these solutions and follow their lead. 
We're going to go to her right now, uh, but we hope you both will stay by. Dr. Rupia Maria and Raj Patel, co-authors of In Flame, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. When we come back, We'll go to the U.S. Capitol steps to speak with Congressmember Cori Bush, where she and others have been sleeping outside on the steps since Friday night to protest the House adjourning without passing another extension of the eviction moratorium for renters. This is the Democrat-controlled House. Stay with us. by Rupa and the April Fishes, whose music was described by the legendary Gil Scott Heron as liberation music. Yes, that is our guest that we just spoke with, Dr. Rupa Maria. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn now to Congress member Cori Bush, who represents Missouri's first congressional district and has been sleeping on the steps of the U.S. Capitol with others since Friday night to protest her House colleagues adjourning for August recess without passing an extension on the eviction moratorium for renters, as nearly 12 million people are behind on rent. Congressmember Bush was formerly unhoused with her children. Her recent piece in Time magazine is headlined, I lived in my car and now I'm in Congress. We need to solve America's housing crisis. Last week, Congressmember Bush introduced the Unhoused Bill of Rights, which she describes as the first ever federal legislation to declare the civil and human rights of unhoused individuals, particularly the right to sit, stand, sleep, or eat in public without fear of harassment or criminalization. Earlier today, Congressmember Bush tweeted, 5 a.m., this morning felt cold, like the wind was blowing straight through my sleeping bag. Since Friday, when some colleagues chose early vacation over voting to prevent evictions, we've been at the Capitol. It's an eviction emergency. Our people need an eviction moratorium now. She joins us from those same Capitol steps. Congressmember Bush, welcome back to Democracy Now! Talk about why you've been sleeping on the steps for days now. You know, the idea that lawmakers, the only ones, lawmakers, our government, um, the levels of government that um, have the um, some type of jurisdiction with this type of a situation, with this crisis, chose not to do anything to uh, stop this from becoming a, a crisis on top of all the crises we have going on in the country right now. I'm out here because um, there is no organization that is that can make this decision to have this moratorium um, in place. There is no there's no corporation there, you know, there's no like uh, big name family. There's no wealthy person. There's no, none of that that can make the decision um, to make sure that between 7 and 11 million people don't end up forced out of their homes. That is solely on the people in Congress or what we've been messaging, the White House and CDC working together in collaboration to get this done. And because that didn't happen on last Friday, um, the House did not get that done. Um, I could not at all walk away from this situation and, and go to, on vacation, recess, knowing that, you know, millions of people could start to um, end up on the streets. So now, we just, I did what I know to do. Uh huh. And talk about what it is you know to do. You know, I'm an activist. I'm an organizer. Um, I got my start 
uh, my official start, I guess I'd say, um, in activism um, after Michael Brown's murder in uh, Ferguson in 2014. And we protested more than 400 days. And even after that, we protested. We've been we've protested for years um, against injustices related to police brutality and more um, and even our um, uh, the housing crisis. There was no way that I can do that work home, at home in St. Louis and then come here and see an atrocity taking place that I have some that I have a hand in and just sit by and let it go. So this is what I asked for. I asked for the people of St. Louis to send me here to be able to represent them, every single one of them. And I asked them to send me here to bring the same energy that I had on the, all, on the streets of Ferguson all of those nights, bring that here in Congress. And so that's what I did. I know how to go ahead and say, look, I'm going to protest this decision. I'm going to protest something that I know um, if we don't do anything, people will be hurt. And so that's what we did. And we, we brought two chairs and set them on the steps. And took a picture and posted it out and said, hey, we're here, you know, come and join us. And people did. And we've been here since Friday night. You were joined by uh, several Congress members, is that right, Friday night? Ilhan Omar, Iana Presley. Yes, all, yes. All it, slept out on the steps? Yes, yes. Slept, slept on the steps. And let me just um, say that— it's, it's not comfortable. We cannot lay. There is a um, there's a law here um, that we can you cannot lay down on the Capitol steps. So we we have to sit up in a chair or sit up on the steps. So that's how we slept sitting up. Um, and we've done that every every night since. And it gets cold at night. It was really cold last night. Not last night, I feel I feel was the coldest night that we've um, since we've been out here. Um, it was raining back and forth, um, and we uh, and so to have other members out here at night. Mondaire um, Representative Mondaire Jones came out here last night. Um, we have to have more bodies, more Congress members to show up. This is the thing. We don't, we can't take the glory if we're not re- willing to go through the grind. There is grime happening right now. So go through the grime. Don't just start snatching glory because let me tell you this, this is not, this is not, um, this isn't easy. This is not performative in any way. I would rather be at home, but I understand the urgency and the need of this crisis right now. And so my body, it hurts physically. I am walking slow and I lost my voice. It's just starting to come back. I've got a lot of honey on board right now and a lot of tea. Um, I'm, I'm dizzy. I'm lightheaded. You know, um, I am, I am so, I'm exhausted emotionally and mentally, but it is nothing in comparison to what our unhoused community members face every single day. And what would happen if we send seven to 11 million people out on the streets? So how did this happen, Congressmember Bush? I mean, we're not talking about a Republican-led House. We're talking about a Democratic-led House. Nancy Pelosi went home to her House. Um, How did—she's the House Speaker. How did this happen? This eviction moratorium was extended several times before. But now Congress just went out on recess. And what are you saying Pelosi should be able to do right now? What do you demand of President Biden? Um, Our message has been clear for the last four days now that um, we're not just talking to one particular group or one or, or one particular person saying, hey, you need to you need to act because it's such an urgent situation. So we're saying everybody that has, everybody, we need to use all the tools in our toolbox right now. So we've been saying to House leadership, reconvene the House, reconvene us. Uh, Chairman Jim McGovern um, of the uh, House Rules Committee came here to the steps, addressed the crowd, and he said that the Rules Committee is waiting. They are ready to come back and do the work. He said, we will be back in a nanosecond if we hear that we have 218 votes. So they're ready. Um, and so we're saying, re- reconvene us. Let's, you know, let's, let's do the work to make sure that we get the, get the whip count um, right. And then come back and let's, let us get this vote. Also, but we're still saying to the White House and to the CDC, you know, give us the moratorium, give us the eviction moratorium. We're asking the president to pin the the executive order 
We need that done. And if there is a court challenge after that, we can deal with the court. The court challenge can be dealt with. At, in the meantime, though, while that is happening, if it happens, we will be able to, in the House, work on getting getting um, the bill that Chairwoman Maxine Waters has introduced, which extends, uh, which has the mor- a moratorium until December the uh, 31st. It's so a must. What about Pelosi calling on the CDC to extend the moratorium? We, again, we have we have to use everything that we can. That was the route that she chose was to say the CDC. We're saying CDC, White House, House leadership. We're even talking about the Senate. Come on. Like we were all elected to serve the people. We didn't sign up to say, oh, not little, not not people of low income. No, 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 no. We don't. We, we're not talking about you. We didn't. There is there was no document that I saw. And when I raised my hand, that was not a part of what I swore. So my my job is to make sure that I'm that I'm speaking up for the 700 over 700 and and, and 30 40,000 people in my district to make sure that they are that their basic needs are met plus anything else that's coming up that is within that is within my wheelhouse to take care of and the same thing for each and every one of the people that you just named Congressmember Bush, can you talk about the unhoused bill of rights this unprecedented bill that you've just introduced Sure the unhoused bill of rights is a resolution that um, it it lays out what the those civil rights protections, what um, what dignity looks like um, for our unhoused neighbors. We need to make sure that it, um, because what we've seen is that um, the protections for our community members who are experiencing homelessness is um, uh, it just doesn't seem like um it's um, respected at all. And this has been going on um, for such a long time and it's going on everywhere. And so we decided to build a framework so that we can build legislation from from this. We want to make sure that um, we're talking about every single thing that, that affects um, someone who is living unhoused from hostile architecture which I think is absolutely, I just can't believe who comes up with these things to to, wanna, to want to um, uh, take a bus stop, uh, the bus stop bench and make it to where you can't lay down on it. You know, those type of things. It's, un- it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And I think about when I was unhoused, when I was sleeping in the car, the one thing that I did have was the car. And I never went into a shelter. I didn't take my children into a shelter because I felt like at least I have a car. You know, I have a place where we can at least lean back where they can lay down. What about people who don't have that? You know, when I think about last night, you know, we were subject to everything that the weather decided to do. We couldn't, that was it. We were subject to, to the rain, the down, the, 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 the the harsh downpours, the cold, the wind, all of that. And then the heat right now. Um, uh, And so making sure that, um, uh, that people who are unhoused have um, access to restrooms, Going to the restroom is a huge is a huge deal. Where do you go to the restroom? Think about how many times you go to the restroom in a day, um, and and having a place to go. But when you are unhoused, then you have to go to the restroom. You go into a store; they want you to buy something before you can use use the restroom. You know, and just to clean your to clean up yourself, they you can't walk in and look a particular way and then and expect them to allow you to just use the facilities. Um, so this bill of rights says. Um, that the rights of every single person who is living unhoused, every person who's experiencing homelessness, that their rights should be protected. They should be, um, they should have the same dignity of anyone who is living housed. I mean, your story alone, Congressmember Bush, as you describe in the Time magazine piece and as you were speaking just now, you lived in your car with your infant, right, six months old and your next child, not not so much older. How did you go from being unhoused, living in the car, working at the same time you were living in the car, to beating a 10-term Congress member, (laughs) standing on the steps of the Capitol where you are sleeping outside and working inside. Yeah, yeah. I So I was able to um, uh, basically get off the streets because my family, uh, my family and um, a family friend helped because they also understood that I didn't have a place to um, put down on an application, a rental application to say, you know, call this call this land, this landlord to see about my rental history. Um, And so which made it difficult to find a place. 
on top of the fact that I was very low income, um, trying to raise two children. So, um, so my, my family was, were helping me, but then also a family friend heard about it and just said, Hey, I have a rental property. You can come and stay here until you all get on your feet. And that is how we were able to finally come off the streets. Um, after living on the street and then living in one of those, you know, um, weekend, you know, I mean, week, uh, you know, those extended stay hotels. Um, but it was through that, and a few other things, just seeing how people, it took somebody to notice what was going on and, and took someone to actually act. I think that is the other thing. It's one thing to know. It's one thing to say, yeah, you know, this should happen and this should happen, this should happen. But it's another thing for somebody to act and, and change your situation. So I saw that and I, <laughs> thank you. I saw that and I pushed that forward. And so the more and more, and, and um, I wanted to extend that to other people because it was extended to me and it saved my life and it saved the lives of my children. So when Michael Brown was murdered, um, before Michael Brown was murdered, I was on the streets working with the unhoused community then, working and um, helping to um, fight sex trafficking in my community. I started to do that work to give back and then Michael Brown was murdered and I took to the streets um, to lend my hand, my hand as um, a medic and, and as clergy, um, still trying to do the same work to help my community and just did not like the response that was coming from those that were in power um, that should have been able to help us and fix and help us to uh, fix that situation. And the community asked me to show up and to run. So I did. What would permanent housing justice look like? I mean, even with the housing eviction moratorium, which has now expired, people owe back rent. How can they possibly pay this in this time? And as you were speaking, we were also showing video of people holding up signs. Um, you can't stay at home when you don't have a home. We're talking in the midst of a pandemic. If one person gets sick, we are all vulnerable. Yes, we are. We are. That's why um, with our unhoused Bill of Rights, uh, one thing that um, that is built in is one hundred and forty billion dollars. It's, it's a two hundred billion dollar uh, bill, but it's one hundred and forty billion dollars that goes towards building of homes. Um, so building of homes that are um, that are affordable for people, the homes that um, uh, that will be um uh, where someone who is uh, who has experienced homeless for a very long time, this is a home that they would be able to um, be able to uh, acquire. Not only that, if we are able to fix, because this this bill talks about ending homelessness by 2025, completely eradicating homelessness. So if we are able to eradicate homelessness with um, with the unhoused bill of rights, what we have right now, this crisis that should not be a crisis. When we have four over forty billion dollars sitting right now that states and counties, other localities can use to help to make sure that that some of this back rent is paid, if we need to go back and and try to work on getting more funding, then we can do that. But I, but right now, what we have on the table already out there, ready to go, that forty billion dollars, we have to move it. We have to move it, and we have to move it down because we need. In order for people to stay in those homes, yes, I un we understand that landlords need to pay the, need to pay a mortgage company. So that is why we're we're also stressing to the states and to those uh, localities to get that money moving and get it into the hands of the people who um, who are supposed to have it. Congressman Bush, how long do you plan to sleep out on the Capitol steps, and how many people are you sleeping out there with? I'm out here. Until change happens, you know, we've I have I've never set a date that let me tell you, our one hour before we came out here, I didn't know I would be out here um, and didn't know each day. I didn't I didn't know if there would be another day. Um, and so we're going moment by moment. And when change happens, we can go home. Well, we one thing that we cannot do is we cannot say, well, we did all that we could do and um, not apply the pressure needed to make sure that. Um, people are forced out of their homes. And um, I think that that's, that's just that's just our work. You have Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh warning last month when the Supreme Court allowed a one month extension of the eviction moratorium to stand that any further extensions would have to go through Congress. So what has the leadership said to you since they went home? So what we are hearing is that 
um, yes, that that is what um, we're hearing that that is what the CDC and that is what the administration is is um, what they're looking at to say, OK, we cannot um, we, we, we can't do this. Congress has to act. But what we're saying is let's do both. Let Congress act and you you do something that can happen immediately. It could have happened you know, on Friday, it could have happened before Friday, it could have happened, you know, it could have happened on Saturday. We're asking them to go ahead and do that um, to at least buy us some time. Uh, and, you know, we know, we know what Brett Kavanaugh said. And, and as, as far as we're concerned, um, you know, that his statement was not a Supreme Court ruling. His, his statement out of his mouth, that was not a Supreme Court ruling. So um, let the courts, if, if, if that's what needs to happen, that's not for us to worry about the house. Our job is to make sure that um, that we're legislating. And right now, the power there is power in the pen of the president of the United States. Well, I thank you so much for joining us uh, outside of the Capitol, outside the House, as you have been unhoused yourself and now a House member. Congress member Cori Bush represents Missouri's first congressional district since Friday. She's been sleeping on the steps of the Capitol to protest her House colleagues adjourning for August recess without passing an extension on the eviction moratorium for renters. Stay safe, Congress member Bush. Thank you. When we come back, we continue our conversation with the authors of Inflamed, Deep Medicine, The Anatomy of Injustice, and we'll look at the connections between the pandemic and the climate crisis. We'll look at a new film, The Ant and the Grasshopper. Stay with us. Malawian musician Alan Moko. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, as we end today's show with a groundbreaking documentary on the climate crisis and the global food system. The film is called Ant The Ants and the Grasshopper. It follows the journey of Anita Chitaya, a farmer and activist in Malawi, with the Soils, Food and Healthy Communities Project, as she tries to end hunger and gender inequality in her village and tackle climate crisis in the United States. This is the film's trailer. I have this gift. I do reach people. How can you allow your partner to suffer with too much work? A Malawian activist. It rains for us maybe three times a year. All the crops dry out. It's on a mission. Soil, food, and healthy communities taught us that it was climate change because of what they're doing in places like America. If you want someone to change, you go to their doorstep with your problem. Anita Chitaya and her friends are traveling across America. I feel like I'm dreaming, and I wonder when I will wake up. To meet farmers and community leaders. God said, you can increase like sand, but he <laughs> never said, spoil the atmosphere. I don't see it as an issue. That's my problem. To talk about climate change. How are you 
you see in the climate affecting your family? We see it more as a political agenda. It would take a global catastrophe to do a complete 180. <laughs> the truth takes long to spread. While the lies spread fast here. But I still have faith. From Raj Patel, author of Stuffed and Starved, and producer of Life Itself and City So Real. There are so many ants, but only a few are lifting the grasshopper. The ants and the grasshopper. That's the trailer for The Ants and the Grasshopper. For more, we are joined by the co-director Raj Patel in Austin, Texas. We spoke with him about his new book with Dr. Rupa Maria, titled Inflamed Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Justice. Your film is now making its way through film festivals. It's interesting. It comes out at the same time as Inflamed, COVID, the climate emergency. Talk about the theme of this film and why you did it. Well, I mean, if, if there's a connection, and I, th I think there's a very deep one, uh, it's that uh, if we are to address the climate crisis, if we are a, to address the uh, the origins of COVID and the the, the, the rage of the pandemic, uh, we need to engage in a kind of decolonization. That's what Rupert and I were talking about when, we, when we're thinking about deep medicine. What, what we mean is to repair the bonds that have been severed by colonial capitalism, bonds between human beings, uh, bonds between humans and the rest of the web of life. And what Anita Chitaya and her colleagues in the Soils, Food and Healthy Communities Project are doing is learning uh, certain kinds of agroecological farming techniques on the land, but also learning that you can't end hunger without addressing gender inequality uh, and ad addressing not just inequality within the home, but inequalities between countries. And so her journey to the United States was one uh, that you know, really wanted to, to put in the front lines the wisdom of communities of people of color and the solutions that they're coming up with. Because, you know, too often when it comes to thinking about how are we going to solve this problem, either we medicalize it and we're like, OK, take an injection, everything's going to be fine. Or we, uh, you know, we, we point to sort of individual therapies uh, or we have white White saviors going to the global south saying, you know, if only you have more wind turbines, everything's going to be great. But in fact, some of the best technology, some of the best solutions for addressing the climate crisis and the health crisis are coming from frontline communities, whether in the United States in you know, the, the, the we, we have a, a scene in the film with the Detroit uh, Black Community Food Security Network's Malik Yakini, uh, where he's talking about the, the steps that frontline communities in Detroit are taking. Uh, and that resonates very directly with the kinds of uh, ideas that are coming from uh, peasant movements from around the world. And so in this film, what we're trying to do is decolonize the view of how it is that we fix the climate crisis and the health crisis by foregrounding the wisdom of uh, you know, peasants from around the world, whether they're in the United States or from Malawi. I want to turn to another scene from The Ants and the Grasshopper that you just described, where Anita Chitaya meets with the frontline communities in the U.S. who are fighting against the climate crisis and its catastrophic impacts. Here, Anita Esther uh, visit Malik Yakini, as you said, executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, founding member of D-Town Farm in Detroit. So that's the other thing, is we're creating a model of democracy. Our organization thinks capitalism and white supremacy is a terrible way of defining human relationships and so and patriarchy as well so at the same time that we and many other people are working to dismantle these oppressive systems we're creating these models of how we might relate to each other that's more equitable that society begins to shift mm -hmm. we, we use regenerative practices here that don't contribute much to global warming this is a rainwater retention pond and we're able to capture tens of thousands of gallons of rainwater in here. And then we run it back down through the fields using drip irrigation tape. And this is our solar energy station. Many farmers would like to not participate in the industrial style of farming, but they feel trapped. They don't know how to survive without the use of lots of petroleum and extremely large amounts of water. We have to show how that can be done so farmers can even see that there's a possibility of doing it and still earning a living. Yeah, that's very true because you cannot tell someone without uh, showing what is the alternative. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Just like we're planting seeds in the ground. We're planting seeds in people's consciousness. An excerpt from The Ants and the Grasshopper. We just have 15 seconds. Raj Patel, why uh, Danita want to come to the United States with her message from Malawi? 
Because she believes that we can change. And uh, I think you know, the, the, the message of the pandemic and of this moment is uh, not only that we, we must recognize that an injury to one is an injury to all, but there is the possibility of change and that it's never too late. Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us. We're going to do part two of our discussion with you, uh, as well as Rupa Maria, um, about the book Inflamed. This is a critical discussion, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. Thank you so much, Raj Patel. I'm Amy Goodman. Stay safe.